Okay, welcome back to the Thigh Through podcast. I'm Matt Bryan, and today I'm joined with Catherine Hunter and the amazing Mick and Phil, uh, local musicians who are doing a great job of what we're trying to do, and that's giving mental health a voice. So our platform Thrive Through is um, just recognising that everybody's dealing with mental health, and but you know, you shouldn't be able to just be able to do more than that and actually just kind of thrive with it as well. Um, so firstly, welcome, Mick and Phil. Um, how you been getting on? We're doing well. We're doing really well at the moment. Mm, how are you? Good. Um, we're good. I think you've yeah. all done better. Yeah, I think you've all done better with your hairdresser appointments than I have recently. So, Oh, yeah, yeah he's been playing with his hair for about half an hour. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Have I'm, you seen it? Yeah. Not, not yet. No, I mean, you know. I was going to go away, but I didn't go. Ah, the guys okay. You guys are all right. You're not in the hair band yet. Um, so, yeah, what um, we're tying in this mini series, uh, which is to do with music and mental health. So, um, aptly named, we wanted to get some musicians on, have a chat to you, see what mental health means to you and how it actually helps you with your music. Um, but before that, we'll just start from the beginning. Um, how is the music going? What kind of stuff have, have you got coming up just now? Um, we've got plenty. <laughs> um, we've been, we've been, just to put it quite bluntly, um, we've been working really hard lately, so we've we'll, we'll got ahead of ourselves. So we've been a song a month continuously um, for the next little while. Um, we've taken a little spin off on the sound, so with a different sound. People think, like when they hear um, who you really are, to think you can with slight differences in the sound, but then we're going to put an artist in and change it again slightly and just put like a much sound. more pop sound mm-hmm. for the next thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Much more pop. Yeah, it could be the end of us, I don't know. I think we'll see. That's it. Done. I like it. Wow. <laughs> so, number one. Yeah, no, I love that. What I want to jump in straight away is like your music, um, when I first heard it, um, and obviously you're very open about this as well, has a lot of um, uh, mental health themes already. And I know it's a big inspiration in terms of what how you write, how you produce. Um, is that fair to say? Is that something that's always been a part of it? I think, yeah, like for me, there's kind of two sides of it. So we've done writing sessions with people where, you know, like people come to us or we go to them and we do the online thing and we write with people. Um, and that's like a different thing because you have like a subject matter already set and you, you know, they'll have an idea and then you just kind of back off that. But when we sit down to write, it happens to be 90% of the time, there's no real thought because before it, there's no, right, this is the subject we're going to tackle today or this is, you know, because it's like I was talking about that, it's kind of pretty much, I have this idea of this this situation and let's write us all about it. It happens to be the majority of the time we just sit down and it just kind of happens by itself. And it happened with Green Screen, which is our latest single, where we generally had, like, a, we were having a conversation while kind of writing it about like personas and how like you get some people so now the kind of thing people will say like oh I'm different once you get to know me or they'll be like oh, I'm very shy at first and I'm not so shy after you get to know me that kind of thing and that's quite a simplified way of expressing you know social anxiety so like you you, you will naturally hold a part of yourself back or you will be slightly different because maybe you want to kind of assess the situation and assess somebody else and as much as it's very normalized now that, that people do that it, it is a social anxiety and it gave us the kind of idea of like you hide behind your own kind of green screen when you go out you 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 are a different person when you're not by yourself you know and it kind of it kind of drove that story eventually it turned into somebody missing somebody and it was a, a heartbreak song but the meaning was there and it, it has that you know that way of saying you know when i'm in this situation this is how I'm going to act. So there's a, a line in it and it says, three, two, one, it's action time and I better not forget my lines. And Stand up straight. Man, I, I, I stand up straight. Don't forget your lines. Don't, don't, don't forget main lines. But <laughs> it, there's a part, that, that part of the song, it again, it kind of jumps back to that, you know, that kind of pre-dehearsed, kind of you think about what you're going to be doing when you go outside or where you're going to be. And like for us, like one of the stupid things I think we do is anytime we do a gig or we go somewhere, we Google the venue before we get there so we know what it looks like inside before we arrive because I have a social anxiety of not of walking somewhere and not knowing what all day looks like. Right. It's a weird thing, but it, it's there in me and I have to accept that and we'll Google it and we'll have to get like a feel of it or watch a video on YouTube of somewhere in this building. It's, again, and it's just having that all that preparation 
all that stuff. Rather than just be able to walk out the door and just be yourself, you you find yourself having to think about it. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um we had a chat earlier on, Catherine, about anxiety, didn't we? And obviously, um you you know, you guys will be great value for you know to talk to us about that and how music kind of has, has helped with that. Um, but Catherine, yeah, we, we were having a wee chat just about anxiety and just kind of different things that are bringing it on just now, didn't we? Yeah, no, definitely. But to back up to social anxiety, that's something like when you were when you were talking about that, that's something that I really um, resonate with because I've always struggled with social anxiety. Um, I do my best to hide it. But I suppose it's true what you're saying that you kind of have this mask that you put on when you're going outside. I have to act a certain way. I need to look a certain way. And you have this persona that you or this sort of act that you have that you want people to see or, or you want people to see you a certain way but nobody actually unless they're close to you knows knows the real the real you and for me like you'll probably find this map quite hard to believe but I actually struggle when it comes to meeting new people I for for years I would put it off again and again and again if somebody wanted me to go on a night out with somebody or just go for lunch with somebody that I didn't know or didn't particularly get on with I just wouldn't do it. I'd make up an excuse because I just I just couldn't face it. I just told myself, oh no, it's better if I don't go. It's better for me. It's better for them. They wouldn't like me anyway, that sort of thing. But it's mm-hmm. but it's social anxiety and hiding behind this sort of barrier it is something that needs to be highlighted. And even earlier today, like we all still, I still get anxiety. We all get anxiety. And my worst anxiety attacks probably happen at night now. And I don't know if that's due to social anxiety or lack of social anxiety because of coronavirus. But listening to music like late at night def- definitely helps as, as, as well. And for me, classical music really helps me because I'm a classically trained musician. So most people wouldn't understand why I get really into Wagner, but I do but because I can relate because I can relate to it and it makes it kind of calms it calms me down. Um, but I just think it's like so important to highlight that music can help any kind of music can help your mental health as, mm. as well. That's actually gave me an opportunity to tackle something here just because I've been going around a bit. Um, when when I sat down, when I started writing one, then before I went to Michael, we brought that song together. Um, I started writing one. That it people end up end up circling around the Black Lives Matter, right? Because that was what triggered me to eventually write the song, but it wasn't the reason behind the song. Uh, get my mind right. So it depends on like there's content, the, uh, the content. There's many reasons behind the song, but also many I can fit within the lyrics, but they have different purpose and meanings. But when I sat down and the, the story about um, was it uh, Floyd? Floyd was Mike. that guy? Uh, he, he died. George Lloyd. It's just like it's just like discrimination, right? But for me, it's like people look at that as in race and stuff like that. But anxiety as well, there's discrimination there, and I feel that personally. Like for example, when you go like a really bad anxiety, you do feel. Well, for me, growing up, you felt. I'm 31 year old, so growing up. I didn't even have a clue what anxiety was. Right? Just felt that it was just me that felt that way. I didn't even speak to Michael about that. He's the closest person to me. I kept that to myself for all those years. And you felt so outcasted, so different, like the black sheep, a shadow on the wall. You know what I mean? You felt so different from everybody else. And that's what one meant to me. It was about barely go out, be who you are, and don't let anybody else's thoughts, like what you were saying there, that's how I felt. It was like, how I look, how I dress how I perceive myself to other people, like the, the, the green screen song, like that scenario, that was so important to me for, for me to be able to deal with my day-to-day life, was to be somebody who I wasn't, just to feel like I fitted in. But through anxiety and that's what one meant to me, I wanted to be able to be one, I wanted to be able to be who they are, it shouldn't matter if you're black, white, purple, it doesn't matter what race you are, who you are, which sex you are, or what sex you like, it doesn't matter, you should be treated the same regardless. And it's the same works with anxiety, if you've got issues or problems. What difference does that really make in this world? We're just one person. Yeah. And we'll all take a turn to live and die. And I, don't, I know that's quite a, I think that's a dark place, but um, it, that's just kind of the feeling of how I feel about the song. And that was why I wrote it, just because I want to be able to be, able to be one on this planet, because we're all here together. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and you've came from a... You've, you've both came from a place of um, going through something... Um, 
like anxiety or any kind of mental health or that and basically I'm, a, I'm assuming what you mean there is you've you've been able to make sense of it a bit better by writing her song articulating yeah. it yeah. and just getting it out getting off your chest yeah. a wee bit is that um, is that something that's, that's yeah, a good like therapy? For me, I, i've had this wee phrase for a, a very long time and I call it my emotional violent cabinet because I know I know it's daft, but because I, I'll write like for, for a long time, I didn't even speak to my wife about my mental health issues because I was I was worried that she would worry because my mum well her mum took her own life and I always always think I, I would I would want to make somebody else worry because it was getting really bad and I I, I wasn't leaving the house and like, I was getting to the point where I was out. Like, I was leaving my car, like, in odd places and just walking about and stuff. I wasn't in my right mind. And I had this kind of thing of not really wanting to speak to him about it and not really knowing how to, like, have a conversation about things. But I could write songs about it without thinking twice. I could sit down and I could write a song and describe how I felt, but I couldn't come and sit across from you on a chair and describe to you at the same... It, it was a very strange, strange thing. Yeah. So I, I started this thing and it was my emotional filing cabinet. So I would write a song about how I was feeling and I would find like an open mic night and I would go and sing the song and it would it felt almost like I was getting it off my chest and I was getting to speak to people, but the, they weren't going to be asking me a ton of questions back and there was no awkwardness. It was just, here's how I feel. And people were like, that's superb. Yeah. And then, now, great, good for you. And then I could leave. And it, you know, it, was, it was a weird thing, but it was, it was the only way I could cope at the time. But as a people have their own coping mechanisms and they have their own way of dealing with things. But at the, at that time, that was that was how I dealt with stuff. Yeah. No, I I think that's really inspirational because I think it's such a good way to to write music and to express how you're feeling through music. And I think that's that's something that people take music for granted. They don't realise that there's hidden depths. They don't realise that there's much more to music than what meets the eye. And you obviously wrote songs and you have a you have a certain meaning behind them and they, they mean something to you, but maybe to the listener who doesn't know what the meaning is, but it might mean something completely different to them and they can take away a completely different different take on it, but it will still it will still help them. And I think that's so inspiring. Yeah. Uh, we think personally that that is the coolest part about writing music. I mean, you, you get two types of people again. You get people that they write it because they, they'll write it for the music aspect, the, the, the instrumental part of the, the, the composition of it, or you'll get people that write it you know, kind of lyric based kind of stuff when it's more poignant of the message they're trying to send. I mean, it, it doesn't have the mental health. They could be writing about anything, their dog, they really love coffee, you know, but you, you just get that, the, the, those two sides of the coin. And for us, it's always been about writing songs and getting things off our chest and tackling things because for growing up, I think we always listen to music and always say to each other, you know, that, like at times I'm worried for people and I'd be like, are you okay? You know, but, like, I think the biggest example of the last 10 years was Chester Bennington when he released the um, the last album uh, before, he took his life, before he took his own life. When you listen to that album now and you hear all those songs, you, you, you do question, you think, wow, why did nobody ask him, was he okay? And I know the, I now know the answer to that because I write so many sad songs and I suppose that we write stuff that's really deep and could be worrying at times, but people just take it and your circle is or they're being very creative and that, that, that this is, yeah. you know, I, I, I've actually had people say to me, you know, how, how, how could you think of stuff like that? Rather than just taking it how it is and saying, wow, you can through something. You know, but it's good that people can take different meanings from things and it may, uh, like, hold on was a good example. Somebody got a tattoo of the lyrics um, on their shoulder and they posted a picture of it and tagged us in it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to too much because she, she did message and she told us all about it, but what she took from the song, from what the song was, was two totally different things. And yeah. for that, for, for, for us, that that was, and there was like an eye-opening situation of, we didn't mean to leave the lyrics quite as open, but we're kind of glad that we did because this girl now feels better. And she says she listens to it, but a lot of times she was listening to it all the time and it kind of helped her through. And I thought, that's, that's amazing that, that you can, you could write something down of how you were feeling at the time and share it with the world and then somebody else listens to it to take it on. And, you know, it, it's like a big circle of just helping each other. 
Yeah, and the thing is, like you said, songs can have many meanings, and I suppose that's the skill sometimes is just to is to open it out there to interpretation and um, while holding on straight, um, you know, true to you know your own inspiration, your own meaning, and um, and who it helps as well is you know a huge bonus to that. Um, I want to ask you about something you mentioned a moment ago. So. Um, obviously really tragically when you were young you lost your mother to suicide um now did that take a while to kind of deal with and was music a big part and 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 kind of helping you come to terms with that as you got older um at the very beginning when we were young i think music was always a thing that was just was just done us to, to want to do but our father our dad is a massive music lover and so was my mum and together they had a crazy music collection, the CDs. I have them. Michael. I have them. The face I put on there, I still don't get a CD. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm only kidding. You have them, so I've got I've got spot through. Um sorry, back to the topic there, but we're saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, have a CD player. I know you have a CD player. How how that is that? I have a CD player. I own a CD player. I'm just going to put that right out there. I, can I have CD. a CD player as well. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a CD player personally. <laughs> you remember that song? It was like CD player, player. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> to get back to the question, I yeah. the question. <laughs> so I know we've been on the street. My mum and dad both love music and a CD collection. So we went to my dad's at the weekend and stuff like that. What he, would, he didn't let us watch football with the friends, right? Because like there was crazy Celtic fans, so if they, if they were losing, you put the whole street with them on, they were losing. So what he did was was set headphones each and we pick a CD at random and put it on and get us to listen to it. So we did that until we went through the whole CD collection. So we'd listen to yeah. everybody from the 50s right up. Sundays so, after it was like Sunday afternoon, they would watch football. My dad doesn't like us hearing his friends on chair or stay at the TV. So he would put us in his room. And remember the big headphones used to get at school, the big, big headphones? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like a double jack. It was a fancy CD player back in the 90s. <laughs> headphones on his each, and he would put... It was all, like, back in the day, it was like it was a big deal to have double-sided albums. You'd have, like, the 24, 25 tracks. And the first half would be, like, 45 minutes, and the second half would be, like, 45 minutes. So you were listening to a full album. And I don't know why we kept them on, but we always listened. And we, would get, we went right through so many different things. But... From a very early age, we did like music. We, we, we did more than like it. We love music. And it's always been there in a strange mm-hmm. way. And I remember standing at Gary's door, my uncle was rehearsing with his band, with we toy guitars and stuff. It's always been there. And our grand took us to chapel every Sunday because we sang as long as we sang before. And we sang in the choir and stuff like that. So we've always kind of been music there. But we got a wee bit older. When we were young, we didn't really think about it all too much because we didn't really understand death, meaning, and how final yeah. stuff like that was. But if we got older and we thought about our mum and stuff like that, we realised that she liked to sing and stuff like that. It, that was when we decided that's what we were going to do. Like we wanted to make her proud. As a kid, you, you do believe like, so much now, I, I still do, but then you really believe that they're there with you, they're watching you, they're standing there. So every you the step you take, you want them to be proud. You want to do stuff that would make them happy. You know what I mean? For us, that was a month. Mm-hmm. And from there, we, we, we did we did start writing songs when we were like 13. I remember the wee jotter we had. Uh, we started writing songs then, and we played it. We did have a piano in the house, they had an organ, right? Oh, so we played it. Fantastic. That was a that organ. A proper. Mm-hmm. And then our uncle had drums and guitars, so then that was the next step. Michael was on the guitar and I played the drums, <laughs> and we just rattled about until we got stuff. Mm. You know, I think the first song, I think the first time we wrote like a serious song when we really thought about it was we wrote a song called Was it, uh, was it Your Sunshine? I think the name of the song was. And that's a, like a really old song. Do you realize like, how old like, that like, song is? It was like number two, like on, on the list of actual full songs that we'd written at the time. And that that's what that was about. It was about losing your sunshine, you know, that kind of. Now, did you ever get that thing where you feel like you're on a really high, like a very positive high for and you do and you get that, or you remember a couple of days, a couple of weeks of just waking up feeling really good and nothing's bothering you, you're not feeling down and you have a wee dip. So it was a kind of song about losing the sunshine. And then we were speaking to my dad one night, we went in for a cup of tea, and he was telling us about our mum, and he was kind of telling us, he does it all the time and still does it, 
was telling stories and he kind of mentioned um, like a red rose. I'm not going to get into it, but he mentioned a lot of details um, leading up to, you know, her dying. And I remember we went, we went back to my house at the time we were sitting thinking, like, like for me, it's a special to understand the thing as you were saying earlier on, Catherine. It, writing about it does help you understand it and it does help you put yourself in that person's shoes. And we thought, I want to try and write a song from my dad's, dad's perspective. 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 And see how it must have been for him. And that, that's where the song I carry you around came from. So I think to answer your question, that's probably the first time we really tried to it, it, use songwriting to understand mental health and not just their own, but other people's and understand, you know, the, the pain and all the stuff that goes like to really think outside the box, you know, to other folk and how it affects your surrounding family. And how old were you in your when you start writing songs about that subject in particular? I think that song um, we were that was 22, no, before we wrote one about that. Before that, we were, as I say, we were kids and stuff, and we never really, we were still learning, so we did a song right, wasn't it, the best day? Yeah, like, maybe 14, um, 15, something like that. But same age, sorry, the reason I'm asking really is to get an idea of when that used to, you know, when that started to become something you would use to, you know, help you, you know, kind of deal with something that was probably very That's traumatic been. for you. Yeah, and the thing when we really decided that we started really writing and started to use it to the advantage, you know what I mean? Um, before then, it was just it was just fun. We were just learning. We could still went out and played with friends, stuff like yeah. that. It wasn't anything serious then, but we got to about that age, that we realised that that was something we were definitely going to <coughs> And yeah. to be fair, we never did it in was to, to even, like, to record music and all that. It was actually just for fun, like, we wanted to busk and stuff like that. You were your kids, your, your goals are so high, you know? We wanted, we wanted to busk and we wanted to go night nights, gig and pubs and do stuff like that. But we wanted to sing our own songs and folk hear them. And it wasn't until we started doing the pub scene and stuff like that, we were in our 20s, that we really realised that we were going to start doing that and we were going to proceed with it. We did. <laughs> but I think to answer your question, I, it probably was kind of late teens, early 20s, when we really started using songwriting as a, as a kind of form of understanding things or even therapy as such. Yeah. And did it help? And because for something that's been a big part of your massively. life, massively, uh, yeah. So, how did that and you know, help? The, the, the ripple effect it's had since then till now is massive. It was somebody said to me the other day about I wasn't having a moan, but I was just being like, you know, like we were you get at this point, I think we can, we can get so bummed out with numbers and figures and streams and all that kind of stuff, and it becomes a big deal. And it was Aidan, and he says to me, he's like, do you know, see, sometimes, like, stand back and have a wee look about where you've came and where you are now to where you were. And it, it got me thinking of my mental health and where I, where I was in my early 20s, to kind of late teens, to where I am now at 30, and how massively, like, I don't have any friends now that I have not met through music. You know, I don't have anybody I speak to apart from my family, out with my family, who I knew before then now because it's had such a massive impact. You know, full on, I only got involved with full on because of, you know, using our own music for, you know, to, to help people that are struggling with mental health issues and get involved with arms because I did a gig. It's just, it's felt like it's been a natural progression since, you know, like late August, 2012 to now where it's, and it's such a slow thing. You don't realize it's happening. Until you take a, you know, you, you stop, take a moment, take stock, and you look back, you think, wow, mm -hmm. this is how this is stretched and how big this circle has became. And, and it does something as well that was, was strange for us, but it was it was kind of good for the family. When we started releasing songs, it actually drew our family closer. Like mm -hmm. our whole family, I got our back 100% with the music and stuff like that. And to hear their songs, and then when they ask us, what does this mean? And then we sit down and then try to explain to them what the meanings for the songs were. Like it's drew us closer, and that is why, like we mentioned earlier, we are going to go back and we're going to redo uh, Carry Around and stuff like that because us and our brothers and sisters that mean that song means a lot to us. We've sung it a lot of times for our family, a lot of times we've sung it against the stuff, but never cut it. We did, and then we like, removed it, we like that. We could do better, so we just rubbish. Uh, rubbish. rubbish, we could do rubbish better. So uh, it was rubbish, <laughs> so we thought yeah. we'd do better with that. Um, but it did, it's drew our family closer. We're all much closer than we ever were before for, for the problem. Yeah. If 
think as well like listen to what you're just saying there like what I'm picking up from that is like it's really important to enjoy the journey like yeah you're right you can get bogged down by all the numbers how many people are listening to your your songs and have we made enough hits that kind of thing but also like if it's something you enjoy and that you're passionate about it's also really important to still make sure that you're like you don't you don't get overwhelmed and that you can still enjoy it even like 10 years later and I think that's really it's really really good to see and obviously it's brought you closer with a lot of people in the music industry and your family and that's that's what music's all about. Phil you sent me something was it a week ago and what was it that said living the dream sorry if you get to do something you love every day you are living the Mm -hmm. dream success is just an added bonus you know and uh, it's, it's an important thing to remember. You, you, you are getting to do something that you're you passionate think about. It's, it, the kind of meaning is you, you think you're chasing your dream, like you've not quite got it yet. But the reason that you're doing it, you're making music, you're recording. Like it's right now, through COVID, we can't get and stuff like that. But we have done, we've done a lot of nice venues, and just to be appreciated, we are living that dream. But it, regardless of how big you get, or how many people are in that crowd, you're still living the dream. You're still doing what you set out to do. And the coolest part of it is that the people who come and see you are people who listen to your music. And you hear the stories, and pe- people do say it's all. The, it's a massive thing, and but people have actually had negative thoughts about it at times. You know, when y- y- your sales have run stories and stuff in the paper, and people be like, "You told them that." I'm like, "Uh huh." You know, like because us when we're, we're just to kind of keep uh, in theme of what we're talking about mental health, it's there's such a stigma still of talking about it, and there's people who are so old fashioned still of thinking, "No, oh, you keep that to yourself." No, no. It, it, you should speak about it yeah. because because you maybe have the courage to, to to tell you know the masses about your stuff. They might hear it and they might think, you know, I, I get that, or maybe they don't quite understand what they're going through themselves until they hear a song that explains. Mm-hmm. Wait, that's how I feel. That that's that's my life right there. And that's that's or what I do. Read something and they think, I they think, wow. I think everything that you said earlier on, um, the panic attacks and stuff like that, you, you can listen to music. And I think that's good as well because sometimes when you're going through stuff, you listen to music and sometimes it helps you understand what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And that's part of why I love writing music. It's just, I'm, I like writing music more than I even like performing it. That's just one thing that I do. I write songs daily. Just sometimes I go with full ones, sometimes I go with bits and bobs, but I just like to write every day, sit down with my guitar and write. Because I don't know your mind. Like a diary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just depends like what brings you peace. Obviously, you you find writing well, you find writing calming. Whereas um, I find playing more calming. I can't. I I have tried to write music. It did not go well. Um, as my higher <laughs> my higher music teacher, and he will tell you. But um, but I do really really love like playing other people's music, and it's just and it's nice to like bring it to life a bit as well, and put your own your, your own spin on it, and mm-hmm. and just to use it as an anxiety or a a coping mechanism and just to remind you that yeah okay you can have some hard times there's going to be ups and downs and like you said you can be like at a level and you're feeling great for two weeks and then hit a slump but it's important to remember that even when you're in that slump that things will get better again and they can get better you've just got to keep trying I think that's the hardest thing is not to give up. It was, it's kind of Matt was saying about how it helps other people and stuff and that, that, that's kind of where it's naturally now leading where people have approached this. We've worked with a couple of people lately, and it's because they they quite like the way we write music and they quite like the stories we tell. And that was kind of, and I've, we have started this thing where we'll sort of have a conversation with them before we even start the write, and we'll just be kind of like, so what do we want to talk about? And what's your story? And, you know, and then we kind of get to know each other a bit better, and then we kind of start to write about it. And the same kind of thing with Tiffany. I don't think it's, she's not a great writer. I think she is quite a good writer, but I think it was more the, the um, you know, she didn't really know quite how she was wanting to tell her story. I'm yeah. sorry, that's yeah. 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 Kind of sat and we kind of worked out, and she did. She did come up with a lot of great ideas, and the song, the song sounds great. It's, it's a love story, but and I liked it. It was about um, her and a man how they first met in their first date, and it was really, it was really nice. That's was pretty sweet, isn't it? But sweet. We had a big conversation of you know about how she feels within herself and and her anxieties, and you know. The ways to like our, our, our body confidence and our self confidence stuff, and we, we can have it's for me it always amazing me just how wide mental health is and and how many different parts of ourselves it affects because we don't get to decide or pick and choose how we feel about a certain thing, or and other people don't get to decide how those things make us feel either. You know, you, you just feel what you feel, um, and 
for me, I, I thought it was quite not cool because that would be insensitive, but I, I, I was I was quite interested by, you know, seeing again somebody else's perspective and, and just kind of having a kind of and sitting talking for a while and thinking, so that that's that's how you feel about this, you know, because maybe because I don't have an issue with that sort of stuff, but I have issues with other things, and then it's just it definitely helps us all understand stuff better. And as a writer or as a storyteller, as such, it it opens up your horizons to you know thinking more of, about things. And when you want to write something or if we sat down tomorrow and say, right, let's tackle this subject, it, we have a better understanding of it to write something about it. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. And it's, um, I think that I probably told you both before that um, when I listen to music, I'm always very intrigued and fascinated by the songwriting process. Like anyone I follow um, to, to a, a decent extent um, is a very renowned like, songwriter. It's a very good, I, I'm always, it's one of the first things I kind of notice um, and by writing, I don't just mean like writing lyrics. I'm talking about how the composition yeah. goes with the mood, how the you know kind of harmonies kind of enhance certain things, and how the melody kind of evokes whatever emotion I get from the song. Um, so like the whole thing, and it's I, I say it's one thing I always kind of jump to straight away when I'm consuming music, and it's when you were saying about you know telling a story, and it's someone that maybe wouldn't have had their kind of voice heard, um, at least not in a conventional way, because maybe they didn't know how to, or, um, you know, or no one would kind of listen. And, you know, and, and there's one thing, I don't share too many kind of personal things a lot, but um, but one thing I noticed when uh, I only just released a song last week, and... By the way, listen to it. Like it yeah, thanks. Um, it's... it's it, Everybody just kind of took it at face value, and I was I, I I was going to be very coy about the meaning behind it, and then I decided not to be, um, and I, you know because it was um, I didn't want people to like you know I mean I want people to interpret in in, in any way they wanted, but opened it up, and it was really just about some uh, it was really just a bit more kind of you know domestic kind of side of my life, and um, and you know it was about my dad and everything, and just how that you know how a big kind of change happened. In our life and how I kind of felt about it, and um, and the amount of people that kind of got in touch with me just to say I didn't know that. I mean, I knew that happened, but I didn't know that's how what how you dealt with it, how that's how you felt. And I'm saying, and I've said the same thing for the last week. Now I've said, you know, it's not it's not like I wasn't. It's like I've been saying this thing. I've um I've been saying the same thing for you know the last year or so about what the song was about. It was about my dad kind of moving away and how I felt about that. And, you know, and just kind of being apart from parents, really, I suppose, in general. And, um, and yeah, it was it was just people were didn't really understand what I'd kind of, you know, went through and how that had affected me mentally. Because um, it did, it put me in a bit of a dark place. And um, somebody messaged me uh, this morning, actually, about it. It was a friend of mine's dad got in touch said just listened to the song again and said I I had no idea that was like about your dad he said he got me quite emotional and it just kind of shows you that it just it, it touches people like kind of deeper mm -hmm. it, you know it, it you know kind of taps into something a wee bit deeper than you know just saying oh this happened you know it's because we, we do have a kind of mentality of just shrugging off anything no matter how bad or traumatic mm -hmm. things are um, especially in writing as well you don't realize it but automatically you do it you you hold yourself back from from saying the truth, from putting things out there because you feel vulnerable. And it's, I think that's, for me, that's one of the hardest parts of writing. I've always got to remind myself that I want to be honest in my writing. But I've also had a statement before as well where they say, don't let the truth get in, in the way of telling a good story. I've also heard that as well. So it's like telling the truth, but say it in the best way you can. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's an aspect of some writing that we have encountered as a problem for us at times. And it's, it, if I was correct, there is a, a, a way of if you are too honest, you you do get in the way of the story because what you're wanting is someone to feel how you felt, you know, and and get like as you were saying, like the composition and stuff, but that you're creating a vibe, you're creating a mood, you, you're taking someone to that place, whether it be good or bad, you're taking them to that moment, and for three and a half minutes or how long it is, they're gonna you want to make them feel what you felt, and sometimes being too honest gets in the way of them feeling it because they may not feel it due to the way you say it. You know, it's complicated, but it, 
if you can get ahead with it, you can understand. Yeah, I like well, it. Yeah. There is a, there is a, an aspect of being too honest. But when I listened to your song, I, I I didn't get that from it either, but I did enjoy it. I, I did generally get the aspect of the five hours behind of a distance. Yeah. I, 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 I took that from it, that there was a distance there, a time zone thing. And I I took that and, you know, I, I tried not to kind of do my thing and be like, you know, ma, you okay? You know, but... <laughs> yeah. I think, I think like, you know, I, I, I mean, I certainly want, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't, I've never want to, to be cryptic and just the kind of work that we do. It's nothing um, I'd, I'd ever want to be kind of cryptic about. So I decided just to be quite open about it. Um, mm. But, you know, like it was like when it, when it first started, that like, you know, that's what it was about. It was just like, I think my thing that was going through my head was, you know, I think I was just saying, this is so stupid. We're just catching up, just like, and you know, like hours behind. Do you know what I mean? I'd be getting like a phone call um in the middle of the night my dad's at dinner or something do you know, I mean? it was like, you know like stupid stuff like that would just kind of really get you know you know it would, it would, we just didn't really get used to and over time it just grew as further apart um but no it was more just to do with you know like you know make sure it's a good song and you enjoy the song and take it any way you want mm-hmm. when i wrote up a wee bit of press about it it was just like you know, it, it's for anyone that's maybe kind of missing people right now in strange times. So, you know, it's lining it about uh, when we live in different times. Like, I mean, we are living in different times right now. So, um, you know, so it's just, it was more just to kind of, just kind of tap into that element. Because um, I've got so many friends that maybe just live in the same town as their parents, but haven't actually been able to physically meet them in months and months mm-hmm. and months. Um, and I know that's hard for people, you know, I, I, I mean, I totally get it. Um, so, yeah, I suppose just, it was just something to kind of come out of that. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, and if people can take any kind of message from it. And to be fair, the thing for me is, was, you know, kind of people understand how I felt, which never, which never really happened. You know, it's not something I would openly talk about. Um, and yeah, and that's what meant, meant more to me than anything else. People went, oh, so you went through that. That's how you felt. And just like you said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go there. Um, it's just about people kind of like seeing that story. And just kind of taking it for what it is and go, oh well, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that. Yeah. And as it's important because again, I, it can go both ways. Like it is nice to be vulnerable in a song as well. It, it, it depends on the song, depends on the right, depends on what you're still telling. And it depends on how you feel mm-hmm. at the time. You know, like, I do like that as well. I, I do, I, I just interpret it, but I mean, I just mean like sometimes when you're in the writing scenario, when you're trying to work your music through any lyrics and stuff like that, sometimes like when we write people nowadays, um, they talk about hooks a lot, but you need to have this, you need to have that. Yeah. So, so, so strong. But I do appreciate vulnerability in a song. And, and to be fair, when I listen to songs, that's the songs I really enjoy the most. Is sometimes when people write in the heat of that, in the heat of a tragedy or the heat of the moment or something that's going on, that's when you get sometimes most vulnerable, but your best writing. And that's when you can tell yeah. a real story. People can relate. Yeah. I think yeah. when we released Hold On, I think for, for me personally, I've wrote a lot of personal songs, and I think every single song we have ever released has come from a personal place. I've been, we've not been a band so far that has just written about, you know, like classic country, you know, beer and trucks, you know, but we've not that kind of country act. But, but I was going to say, because I wrote one a while ago and it's been out in July. I was going to say, never. <laughs> We, we won't dive in. And that was only because somebody said that I couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. Somebody yeah. mentioned this to us. He couldn't, couldn't. couldn't really write country. And I thought, can I not write country? Uh, okay, I mean, I'll write country. So I can't wait it. for that. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> People say it's, we couldn't really sing uh, a big song either. So it's called Cher, Cherry Red Time Machine. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Crazy thing, man. So, but yeah, take it back. Hold on, probably the most vulnerable song I think we ever released. And Actually, as you were saying about how not feeling comfortable to speak with things, when we released it and people asked us about, it was, you know, we, we got together and I was like, I don't really feel comfortable being totally honest about this. I was like, what can we say? Like, without telling a lie, how do we go around this? And we just generally, you know, like the same kind of thing as yourself, it was just generally about missing someone who wasn't there, Um you know, and, and want to be with them, but you couldn't be. And it's just kind of that. It, 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 the song is about, and I still don't really feel comfortable going on about it, but oh, it's geez. about love. And it's about, you know, like missing someone very close to you, yeah. you know, and 
especially when it's family, you know, nobody died, but it, it's it's very vulnerable. And you get those moments where you, I actually think probably one of the only songs I've ever written, and it was just kind of as start to finish. There was no process to it. There was no, wait, right, that's going to be the chorus or that's going to be the verse. It just happened in one take. I just picked the guitar up. You were there uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the dining room and we just kind of sat and it just happened in one go. The whole thing, start to finish, it was just, that was it. It was a song. Yeah. I think, was, that's, I think that's the important thing about when vulnerability and kind of music kind of, you know, collides. You enter a, a state of flow, you're in a flow state and you just, mm-hmm. and you're just totally immersed in it and it just writes mm-hmm. itself. You know, yeah, that, I wasn't really feeling part of it. Like that was that was probably the best way I could put it. I didn't feel part of that. Right, there was no moment where I thought about it. As you say, it was just like a thought. It just happened. Mm-hmm. I just kind of opened it, and it just the words came out, and it was just that was it. And you know, it took us a long time to release it. I mean, I think it was about six years before we really gave it to MD, But it it was actually on the first EP. It, and it was, was, and it was one of the first songs we removed. Yeah. Just Michael didn't feel comfortable, so. Aye. Went, that's fine. We just mm. removed it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, better. And a lot of it is because we feel like we want to redo it. But it's not so much we weren't happy, but we like the songs. We do love those songs and we are going to redo them. We just didn't feel like we'd done them justice. We just felt like we could do we could do more with them. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. And, and Catherine, we were talking a wee bit about this before about um you know how music can can help yourself in so many ways for the kind of therapeutic aspect. Um I think you were asking is just as well should it be more of that is it yeah no I, I I definitely think that there should be more music therapy or even in schools that music I I don't know what it was like for you guys but growing up there was never really um a focus on mental health if you had anxiety or depression or you felt different you were kind of you felt like you had to keep it to yourself and yeah there was the mental well there wasn't even a mental health nurse but you had guidance support I think we had at our school but you still you never really felt like you could like talk to them about how you were feeling and I I remember like eventually I just couldn't hide how I was feeling anymore and I actually had people making fun of me because of my depression because they didn't understand what was Mm. what was going on and these were people that I regarded as friends and they laughed at me like oh you're in deep depression you're in deep depression I was like well yeah I am this is not anything to be laughing about but music helped like and I didn't really appreciate being in an orchestra because I was playing with people that I wasn't particularly comfortable with but when I was at home and playing piano by myself that was for me and that was what that's what that was what comforted me and so I've always found music as a therapy but I suppose like my question is do you think there should be like music a more therapy in schools or just somebody that will talk be there to talk to youngsters yeah. because I, I know for a fact that at my old school there's still not enough of that and b mm. should music come like like be a factor in that like there was a lot of pressure at our schools like oh yeah, yeah you need to learn an instrument but no it was more for like a sh- for show so that the school could show off oh look at all these students we've got them performing this that and other thing but it wasn't really for our own benefit other yeah. than for eventually for a uni application oh yeah I've done this but mm-hmm. like nobody really told you how comforting it could be nobody really told you that it could benefit you your mental health so I personally mm-hmm. think that that should be stressed at school that yeah okay it's I'm good so glad that you've mentioned it because I was actually I'm, yeah I, at full on we have had so many conversations so what full on does is we use the performing arts as as a form of therapy and recovery from mental health uh, I, I, although that sounds weird because be whether sick. yeah I know that sounds weird because whether we like it or not we're all born with mental health whether we have good mental health or bad mental health you know it should be something that we're always regulating through our lives. So we, we were having this big conversation where we were kind of talking to some of the kind of bigger people in North Lanarkshire Council the other day. And part of the conversation was so that people, like kids in high school, your mental health should be regulated from a young age. Whether that's, you know, and I don't mean this in the sense of, you know, forcing somebody to sit in a chair and talk about something. There should be a thing of you go and see someone at least once a year just to talk to them and, and see if you're in a, a great place and stuff, then, you know, you got a chat for an hour. And, you know, it's, it doesn't need to be a big serious thing, but pe- 
there should be more awareness around, especially kids. I have a, I have a son at nearly 15, and the way school is for him is not much different from the way school was when I was in high school. There's so many things that just have not changed that yeah. should have changed a long time ago. Fulon has a... We, even through lockdown, we have had like the the Facebook rooms and the online Zoom like things where people come on and we all perform. We all, you know, we all have fun. But at the same time, it's it's also there's a very serious aspect to it where we know why we are there, and we take mental health seriously. But you're also in a group of people who all have their own mental health issues, and we're very aware of each other, and we use it to support each other mm. rather than sitting down at a table you know, and, and trying to work out all our differences and, you know, it, it's more of a support thing and having, the, knowing those people are there and knowing that that support network is in place helps you. It, it just, you know, like sometimes it's not what you say, it's what you do. And the fact that you go to the group or that you take part in something that you know you're accepted in, you're in a group of people, it's a safe space. You know, you can, like, as you were saying at high school, there was a place where people could go but well, as a safe space, you know people understand, you know people are, you know, aren't judged, they're not going to judge you, there's kind of no judgmental tones within it. It's hard for a high school situation. We have been to high schools, me and Philip have done it, um, about three or four years ago now, I think it was three years ago, you went, and it was really tragic. There was a lot of kids um, going to this high school taking their own lives a few years ago. I think, I think the total was seven, and it's horrendous. Yeah. But the, the way the high school dealt with the situation was that they tried to get the kids not to talk about it. They yeah. tried to distract them. Tried from, to, yeah. yeah, they wanted to distract them from it rather than have them try and deal with it and understand it. It was more of a, if you don't think about it, it's not there. Mom, mom let's move it's, on from it's, this. It's, and it causes mental health in the first place because yeah. you put it to the back of your mind. So what we learned, right, I'm actually going to share something very personal that I've not talked about before. Like, I don't know if you'll be able to see it here. If you look at my fingers, the tips of my fingers around here, you'll see the state they're in, right? And that's when I was younger, right up until now, with my anxiety and problems, I used to bite my fingers to the point that they're either they're a terrible state because that's how I dealt with it. And now I sit and do this with my fingers, and I do that. And if I still get stressed, I'll bite them still. And that's what started for them. And that step from that is like, and that's what we're talking about earlier on. I hate to go back to it, but we're talking about one. That was like my hit back for that stuff is because... It's like, it's one thing to say you've got anxiety, you have, you have mental health problems. It doesn't make you different just because you have those things. What makes you stand out different is because people make you feel different for it. And that's when you start to feel like you're odd, you're different, you're a shadow in the world. And that's what started causing that. So through that, then you get, you get bullied. And then through that, it causes anxiety and stress for me. And then I end up getting to a point in my life where I had to go see therapy because I had massive outbursts of anger. And I actually get put out of my school. And I get sent to Kittock High School, which was um, East Go Bride, because I attacked my teacher in the end, because he uh, brought my mum up. He taught my mum. And that day, I had a bad day. I'd get bullied in the playground. And I'd end that class that day. And I was doing my work. And somebody in the back of the class was speaking to me, who I actually didn't even like at the time. But because I was younger, I was scared. I spoke to them, even though I didn't want to. And I get in trouble for that. And the teacher came and said to me, if your mother was alive just now, she wouldn't be proud of you. And that's, that, that was God honest what the teacher says to me. Oh. And I attacked him. I had a blowout that day and that was it. I got sent to another school. And then from there, when I went to that school, my life got even worse because they kids grew up in troubled homes and problems like that. So they were tough. They were tough. They, they grew up hard. So they, like, for somebody like me to get into a school like that just was like, it threw into sharp and fisted waters. You know what I mean? It made it even harder. And then from there, when I left, High school. Now, I don't share any of these stories usually, but then when I left high school, eventually I got into different crowds and then the stuff. I ended up homeless and I had to sleep in benches for a while. And then I moved to Dundee with my sister and we lived there. And she didn't have a lot either. She had a big, massive hole and a living room wall, what you can see outside. And we stuffed it with towels to keep the heat in. I went through a lot of stuff through that. And that a lot of those things affected my mental health. And it wasn't until I got to about 18, 19, I managed to get myself a job. Again, and I picked my life back up from there. So, like, I look at my songs, there's things in there that people, and, I, and I'm quite honest, I wouldn't pinpoint the parts, the parts out either because I feel as if it's just very vulnerable, but I put them out because folk don't know what it means. 
Mm. But these are things as well, and that's what happened to my hands, like you were saying, people pick on you, people, and that's when you start to feel different. If it wasn't made to feel different and folk were there to help you, and it wasn't treated like a big deal, then you wouldn't feel like that. Yeah. And I wouldn't have had that kind of life I had if I didn't made, if I wasn't made to feel like that at school. Mm. So what you're saying is, so earlier on, when these things happen, there should be a different approach rather than, you know, right, you're out and never going to go and take you to a place that's now going to make you feel even worse or make you feel even more different. Or at a more extreme level, make you feel ashamed from now. Not even the teachers want anything to do with you. So that there should be a change where when someone's behaving that way or someone's showing these things, that you, know, you, you shouldn't just be kind of cast aside. You should be spoken to and people should take the approach of, is this person okay and do they need help? Rather than, you know, you're, you're cast away. I agree with that completely. And from, thanks very much for... Yeah. Share what you did there, Phil, by because it's you know, um, you've you know, obviously it's really personal, but what I took from it was a pattern of them not knowing how to deal with you as the individual and what you were going through, you know, mentally, and even to the point where something not a word I like to use, but to the point where that thing that happened in school with the teacher, even at that point where it may have been, you know, a so called kind of like, um, like a trigger point, they, they still didn't even recognize that and instead moved you kind of school and dealt because I'm assuming they didn't kind of sit you down and deal with the situation like what's going on with you kind of thing no, and I was that, suspended and then that was it then they spilled me I went back for a meeting my yeah. and they spilled me they so, the and then so, yeah through. so what you get told is you get told that either you know don't talk about it or what you're feeling or doing is wrong and how the way you're behaving is wrong and that's no way to, you know think about how no, be a good boy I suppose in a sense you know for lack of a better term but you you're told to behave and, you know, do as you're told. And if you're having, I mean, this is the thing as well. We, we did a thing with, with Phil on, we were off a bit. It never, it never came to, but we wanted to do it. Well, we I think it's, well, due to coronavirus, we're off to go to um, Pullman to, you know, do like musical therapy and stuff with, mm. with the people that were, you know, the, the prisoners. Because we also feel that life decisions and things that happen in your life are all, you know, most certainly take you where you end up. Yeah. Whether that be, you know, a, a bad place or, you know, prison, which I don't think any one of us would ever want to be. But, you know, and I don't want to take a co conversation to such a that place, but I, I'm just, 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 this is what we do. I mean, this is what we do sometimes just to give that a voice and that is, that's important. If, if, if there was a, like, if you imagine the life as a split, as like a piece of string, and if there was a point in that piece of string where someone just kind of went, right, this is where we need to deal with something. Otherwise, this is going to carry on. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think everybody should have that. It's also teaching people at a younger age to be more self-aware of their feelings and be more self-aware of, you know, well, that this is this isn't right that I feel this way and I shouldn't feel this way and I need to go speak to somebody. You know, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure someone can help me with this. Whereas I think because of the way things have been for such a long time and they continue to be the same way, you know. As I always say, same approach, same result. If you approach something different, you get a different result. But if you keep doing the same, the same approach, you're going to end up in the same place. You know, yeah. it's if you're like baking a cake, you put an extra egg in every time. You're always going to end up with that bad cake. You know, it's you need to change how you're doing, how you approach something if you want some change. There has to be a well, difference somewhere there yeah. in the chain. When you say about different change, something that I do when my two kids is because of stuff like that. I do with my two kids is. What I tell them is being different is good, not bad. People who follow are like laps to the slaughter. People who blaze the rain trail are on the road to greatness. Being different is a good thing. If you're the same as everybody, then there'd be nothing to feel about you. There'd be nothing. You'd be plain. So I tell my kids that if they feel different, that's a good thing. Follow that. Be who you want to be. One of my kids loves to cosplay. Loves to dress up like his anime characters. Another one loves horses and just different things. And I, I make sure that I make them follow whatever makes them happy and make them feel good about that. And all the time, I know it sounds crazy, but even something so small, I'll tell them I'm proud of them. I'll tell them how good it is. And I don't just make a wee deal, I make a big deal of things. And if I'm speaking to them, I get into high detail about things and make them feel better about themselves, trying to build confidence in them. So when they grow up into this kind of world, they don't have to deal with these kind of problems in their mind because I've already gave them that built their things into them at a young age. So they'll always feel positive and good about this themselves. So they don't get to that stage. When people are them down, they don't to, get to know. To be who they really are. <laughs> who they really are. Yeah. 
I, it's, yeah, you know, I'm glad you said that because I, I, I would say, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of torn which my favourite song of yours is now, but that was definitely my favourite when I seen that come out for a while. I think, that, I, think, I think that spoke to a lot of people, that one, and you'll know better than I would, obviously. But for me, personally, it was about staring down the barrel of a divorce, which, which never happened, you know, and I, I'm, I'm so happy, but it, it was because, you know, I was feeling rubbish at the time and I didn't really go to my wife to speak about it. And I I felt at the time that because of, you know, we, as, as crazy as it sounds, we don't, we, we're not famous by any means. You know, we, people laugh at us and say we're Hamilton famous because people know us and Hamilton and we get stalked and stuff, folk talk to us, right? But there's, there's been a shift in the last kind of few months where things are getting a little bit different for us. And, you know, like maybe even the end of last year, things were different. You know, people were talking to us more. There was, like, you're getting to Asda and people are saying hello and you don't know these people. And, you know, my, my, my wife had this thing of always saying, you know, I, I'm not, that's not who I want to be. That's not who I am. I don't want to be part of that kind of thing. And, you know, she's a very private person. And, like, can it all stem from, do you know, like, maybe sometimes in a relationship or in, in your life, you need to be who you really are. You need to be you. You know, try to change yourself will only get you down or, or trying to suppress a part of yourself because that person doesn't like it, you know, it, it's all very ugly very quick. And at that point, we were just kind of in a situation of, do we continue like this or do we try and work through it and see where we end up? Or, you know, do we just cut it off and, you know, let those weights off your face? And like, you know, and my yeah, side of that was um, me and my partner split last uh, January last year. We were together 10 years and we split so that was kind of like a like a goodbye with the dust settles kind of thing. It's like, right, okay, let go of the, all the bad stuff that happened there and just wish each other the best. And go yeah, that's what it is, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, like I said, it's, it's, I think a lot of your music kind of speaks volumes to people, and I think that's a one thing I always kind of commend you on. That This is a shameless PR speech here. But <laughs> go for it. We, we, have, we have the album almost at completion. We will be releasing them one song at a time f- from now until December, just because we want each song to have its own little kind of moment for folk to, you know, listen to them and appreciate them separately rather than as an album, which sometimes are overlooked. Mm-hmm. But as you were saying, Matt, and, and it's true, like, if you listen to if you listen to your music, you will be hearing doing one a month until December. So we'll get plenty of songs left to come and then at the end I'm just going to say right yeah, don't shoot me at the end of the year we'll get another surprise and I'll be back there stuff I'll just go through another one yeah. so Ooh, we'll so kind of be tight is that exclusive is that exclusive to us though exciting times to come then year. we never released them we just kept them we decided just not to release them we're just too busy even just we'll get families as well so it's, at that time of year it's really hard to juggle it so we thought we'll make them through this year and then just put them in December so that's it so we'll get yeah. two Christmas songs to put out. And uh, as you suspect, yes, they're sad ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, I've, um, I've, thoroughly, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I think just, you know, we kind of wanted to explore the topic of music and mental health anyway. And um, you guys have actually opened it up tenfold, I think, from the conversations we've had tonight. Um, oh. And, you know... I, you know, what I can say about you guys is obviously met you a few times now. Um, Mick and Phil are, you know, they're not just kind of breaking down this wall with mental health or bulldozing it, and they're giving it a voice. They are doing it through music. They're doing it with conversations. They're doing it with help, um, helping other people, and um, they're just doing such a grand job. Um, so I mean, like I, like I said, I'm a fan. I would I would advise anyone to go and. Um, you know, give their music a listen um, and just hear what they have to say as well because you guys obviously spoke tonight with so many, you know, interesting stories and takes on your own journeys um, and, and and one of you said earlier on, I can't remember who it was, but um, about where you've, I think it was yourself, Mike, you know, where you've been to where you are now and mm-hmm. and I think that's something that I think we can both kind of really commend you on and, um, you know, long may that continue and, you know, you're, you're both very self-aware as well and I think that's very, very important what you're doing um you're very aware of um how how vital music has been in your life how much of a therapy it's been and how it's been able to help you thrive as well as, as my voice cracks brilliant um <laughs> but you know like it's, it's, it's been it, it's been a pleasure having you on um and i'll also let you kind of close it where can we find you normally 
you can find us on our, our, our kind of main thing is Facebook. You can find us on our Facebook page at Mick and Film, um, our Instagram page at Mick and Film Official, and on all social platforms like Spotify, TikTok. Apple Music. I but we're now on TikTok. TikTok. I'm on TikTok. We're yeah. doing yeah. so dances and stuff. I think. I think we'll Fantastic. Well, listen, that, now, that, now I'm going to download TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, like I say, this is what it's all about, guys. Thank you very much for coming on and thank you everyone again for joining us on Thrive Through. <laughs> um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see all our fantastic edits of lighting as we record through the night. Um, but we're also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts as well, or thrivethrough.co.uk where you can see all our content coming up. <laughs>